Nicholas Niarchos is a journalist who has been published in The New Yorker, The Nation, Time, The Guardian, The New York Times, The Welt, and many, many, many more. He is again a guest on this podcast whose work delves into the journalistic adventure tropes for which I project so heavily onto. Nicholas is the author of a yet-to-be-named book, which will be an intimate investigation of cobalt mining in the Congo and the role of cobalt in the, in the international supply chain. Nicholas is actually now banned from the Congo after being arrested there last year in uh, circumstances where he was poking his nose around in a place that the authorities in retrospect said he could not. So it's a little bit of a corrupt botch job there. A full write-up of this experience is soon to be published in the Interlope magazine. In this podcast, you can expect to hear the Congo in Nicholas's words, a brief history of kleptocracy in the Congo and the plundering of its natural resources, an explanation of cobalt, uh, what it was like meeting Alec Baldwin, getting arrested in the Congo, and more and more. Now, you guys know the drill. This podcast took me over five hours to put together, but will only take you five seconds to review. So I thoroughly encourage you to pump your good juice with lots of force and vigor into the algorithm. So swipe up your phone right now, whether it's Spotify, five stars, Apple, five stars, and a nice comment, anywhere else you listen, put energy into the algorithm and that happens via interactions five star reviews playing it telling your friend telling your mate telling your mum telling a colleague spread a curious worldview far and wide and without any further ado here is the great nicholas niarchos nick introduce the congo to us it's beauty it's demographics it's economy it's people and it's corruption um so the democratic republic of the congo is a giant country in the middle of uh, Africa. Um, it is a country that was first colonized by uh, the Belgians uh, starting in uh, the late 19th century. And um, after 1960, it became independent and was ruled um, after a series of uh, rebellions and so on um by a uh, sort of pretty ruthless and very corrupt um but western western backed uh, dictator known as Mobutu Sese Seko um and uh he basically uh drained the money from the country um and then what you know infrastructure and so on was left was um largely destroyed in a series of uh, wars after 1997 um, which left uh, more people dead than the uh, second world war it was a uh, sorry not more people dead, more people than any conflict um, since the second world war uh, dead and um, displaced uh, millions and and wounded uh, thousands of people and so on and so forth so um you know, it's a very turbulent, very uh, corrupt country. Um, it's the size of Western Europe. It's bisected by a giant rainforest in the south. There's a lot of um, uh, copper, cobalt, and uh, and some lithium uh, deposits, um, making it one of the richest uh, uh, country in terms of natural resources. In the west, um, sort of southwest, there are a lot of diamonds. In the northeast, uh, there is coltan, there is tin, um, there are tourmalines. So it's a country of great uh, natural abundance, but it is also a country um, where that natural abundance is uh, stolen on a regular basis, um, both by internal and external actors. Um, and then also the, there is... Uh, uh, there are resources that are, that are legally exploited um, by sort of legitimate outside companies, but there are also questions about how those companies came by the contracts um, that allowed them to exploit those resources. So that was a long answer. No, it's good. It's population? It is a country of 92 million people. And you hinted quite a lot at the kleptocracy uh, the Congo mm -hmm. has experienced, I guess, in its recorded history. Um, mm -hmm. 
can you speak specifically to that and then as well open up on this Dan Gertler fellow? Okay, so um, kleptocracy in the history of Congo, I mean, the Belgians first started exploiting Congo for rubber. Um, actually, they first started for ivory, really, and they, they were looking for gold. Um, and then uh, rubber became very popular because of uh, bicycle tires and uh, and then shortly after car tires. And um, it, this became a sort of incredibly sort of sought after in the increasingly globalized world this became an incredible increasingly sought after um raw material and it came from trees which took quite a long time to to to, to yield um to yield uh rubber and um in, in which made it very difficult to plant in other parts of the world so for for a while congo had a sort of monopoly on rubber um, which is ironic because um, the uh, you know the current state of affairs is that uh, Congo has a lot of co cobalt and and now actually quite a lot of lithium, which is central to the uh, automotive industry, and um, mm. and you know there was a there was a uh, you know it's 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 funny that how history sort of repeating itself again that yeah. this that this uh, resource that was key for key for, key the for the automotive industry chain. exactly um in the late 19th century um it's kind of you know we we're, we're only we're talking about batteries now um and anyway so the belgians sort of came in and sort of fairly ruthless i mean very ruthlessly exploited rubber and then that was re revealed on a kind of mass scale by a by a whole a series of people um including Roger Casement, who was an Irish diplomat who was sent to uh, the DRC, um, and or, or the Belgian Congo, as it was then known. And that became a huge uh, sort of human rights issue, one of the first sort of big human rights issues of the modern era. Um, and uh, King Leopold, who ran the Congo as a kind of personal fiefdom, um, and he, it was his kind of personal property wasn't part of the Belgian state was forced to give over his uh his um his realm to to the Belgian state and then it became administered directly by uh by Belgian in I think in 1906 but it was the early sort of sort of mid 1910s um and at that point um Belgians were quite lucky again to to have this colony um, because rubber, you know, the rubber trees in other parts of the world had started sprouting, um, and you know they'd lost the monopoly on rubber, but suddenly everybody needed uh, copper for copper wiring, and um, for you know munitions during the war and so on. So and copper prices jumped again. So so this was a kind of um, another boon to Belgian industry and so on, um, and. So uh, Congo was once more exploited for copper, not in a particularly, not n not in as brutal a fashion as it had been for for rubber, but um, but certainly in a way that was not particularly um, beneficial, shall we say, for the for the uh, Congolese people on the ground. Um, there was some sort of attempt to uh, educate and uh, train. Uh, engineers and people to work in the in the in the copper industry, um, and that sort of showed after independence quite a lot of the kind of um, intelligentsia of post independence Con Congo were these people who'd been educated um, in the copper producing regions in the south, um, but it also created this kind of um, well there was historically a, a difference between north and south. But uh, but it also exacerbated that difference. Um, so one can talk about you know colonialism being um, being a kind of uh, 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 stoking the fires of these sort of separatist and sort of ethno nationalist movements. Um, then again, you know the the South really historically had very little to do with no the North as well. So. 
there are arguments on both sides of that. Anyway, um, not to go too far down that down that road. Uh, so anyway, um, going back to um, Dan Gertler, who you asked about, and I hope you can edit that out about really <laughs> randomly having an alarm. Um, Dan Gertler, um, so copper was obviously a, a very important commodity to the DRC, um, and d diamonds were as well. Um, what is very interesting um, in the sort of uh, history of like post independence, oh, sorry, post uh, post Mobutu Congo. So fast forward all the way up until the nineties, um, Mobutu has kind of completely stripped the copper industry um, in the south of uh, most of its assets, including most of the heavy machinery. You know, the copper mines are shells. They're falling to pieces. He's basically allowed people to 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 in, engage in artisanal exploitation, um, which is which is uh, basically digging using uh, Stone Age tools, you, you know, um, picks and and shovels and so on, um, to uh, remove this uh, you know the the very rich and and not particularly deep, which is one of the keys. Um, or from from the ground and then sell it on to sort of small traders who who sell it on to kind of medium traders who who will then kind of sell it into the international market, um, and um, so Dan Gertler comes to DRC in his I think he's twenty three or twenty four in ninety seven and he or ninety eight. Um, and uh, Mobutu has just fallen, and um, the uh, uh, you know the the, uh, the Congolese army is 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 in route, and the rebels have taken Kinshasa, and the airport has just been secured, and this guy who's just finishes Israeli military service um, lands, and he's the son of uh, son of or grandson of uh, one of the founders of the Israeli Diamond Exchange. And one of his ambitions basically is to um, vertically integrate the, the, di uh, the, the uh, vertically integrate diamond trading from the bottom all the way to the top and um, from mine to, to buy it basically. Um, and I think he's called Moshe Schnitzer, his grandfather, but don't quote me Great on that. Nice. Great name, and um, so then what happens is that he um, makes friends. Nobody really understands who introduced them, but some people say it's um, it's through another um, interesting character called Benny Steinmetz, who was um, who was uh, involved in a the mine of Guinea, exactly in Guinea. Um, uh, and he basically, um, and I'm not sure whether that's necessarily true. That it's, it, I mean, it's pretty well documents, documented that they are, or they were at one point, pretty close. Um, but it's unclear how again he met um, he met uh, the ruling family um, that had just sort of come in with the, uh, the head of the rebels, um, which is the Kabila family, and. Um, he very quickly became friends with the younger Joseph Kabila, who was about the same age, uh, who was um, sort of top military commander in the rebel um, movement. And then he was given the entire... Di so this is the sort of early 2000s. He was given the entire output of di diamonds. He was sort of managing the entire diamond output of the DRC. And had a sort of monopoly on on Congolese exported diamonds, um, and then a lot of uh, international NGOs made a stink about it, and uh, and he by by two thousand three was was sort of kicked out of um, uh, of that role, and everybody thought, okay, well, you know, this was a br and people say that Blood Diamond was based on him uh, of this. I, I I don't really think that's true. Um, but um, but maybe he was one of the characters that that in, I mean it just doesn't really track with the the story of Blood Diamond, but um, he certainly was he was certainly able to to uh, to take control of these these uh, diamond resources very quickly. 
Um, some people say it's because he um, helped arrange uh, military training for uh, Congolese troops in uh, the east part of the country because they were then at war, war with, with Rwanda. Um, but again, nobody's really ever been able to get to the bottom of that story. Um, and he has strenuously denied it. Um, so those, so so that's a kind of background of Dangart. And then suddenly um, he sort of comes back onto the scene again in about 2004, 2005, um, after the father of uh, Joseph Kabila has been assassinated by one of his bodyguards. Um, and Joseph Kabila basically gives him uh, the opportunity to buy a series of mines in the south of DRC for very, very cheap. And he takes control of these mines and then sells them on to larger multinational companies, including um, including Glencore, including, uh, um, including uh, what's it called, Freeport McMoran, including these sort of larger companies, um, which are able to then, um, you know, make these mines into in, into kind of uh, great sort of profit centers. But at the time, they're kind of very run down as, uh, assets. Um, the argument that, you know, people people at those big multinational mining companies say is uh, have is that they, they say, listen, nobody would have bought those assets at, at that time and um and and put the amount of money that we put into it into them um whether or not that was true it was very clear that gutler was buying these assets for and i think that is true to to, to a large extent actually i i just think that one also has to look that uh, at these assets that gutler acquired for a very knockdown price and then think about where the money was going um and there's been a lot of you know reporting by various different uh, uh, outlets out there, and and uh, you know Michael Cavanaugh at Bloomberg has kind of led the charge, but there's also been a, you know a great deal of other um, people sort of working on this. Um, but uh, Gertler has essentially Gertler seems to have sort of funneled a lot of this money into um, into sort of. Uh, bank accounts in the um in the British Virgin Islands and uh there seems to have been a lot of connections with the uh Kabila family and there's lots of suggestions about you know where that money went anyway um without getting too sort of into the weeds on that um he sort of became a stat, and and there there are many people like Dan Gertler as well, um, but he sort of became a stand-in for the entire corruption of the Kabila regime. And I'm not sure if you saw recently. I mean, he agreed to hand back um, most of his assets. I think basically all of his assets to the to the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So so uh, the Gertler story in some way has sort of ended, although. It never really ends. It seems to have ended several times um, now. Uh, and there's a question as to whether he was as influential as, as many people thought, but he is he is a fascinating character. Um, he seems to have also lost quite a lot of the money that he had, um, which is, which is uh, quite interesting because if you look at you know, what he was selling these mines for. I mean, he should be uh, a billionaire many times over. Um, so one also has to wonder where a lot of, a lot of that money went. And interesting details about him is that he um, has been chased, by, I think, US law. Trump pardoned him or something like this. I don't know what the details yeah, are. Yeah, Trump. There. He was sanctioned, and then Trump Trump removed the sanctions, and then Biden put them back back on, or he froze the sanctions, or something like that. Do and, you consider? Um, oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 no. And and yeah, he had four different. There were four different uh, international investigations of him, and so on. Do you consider Robert Friedland uh, to be? in the same 
ballpark as uh, Dan Gertler? Or is there no, also an element no. of very legitimate mining business happening in the Congo? No, I mean, I think that uh, Friedland found an asset which was um which was very very rich i don't think anybody i mean i think that that that's a case of um you know they found something that was really out there nobody really thought that it was worth anything and they have developed it uh, now i think there are different questions around that mine um and i think that you know he has been involved with the other mining companies um you know trying to uh, who, who who have all kind of tried to to actually I, I i want to be a bit careful here because i i, I think um they have committed to pay a, like a fair share and so on and they do have they have do have good um they do have a fairly good public image in the DRC, um, Ivanhoe. However, um, there still are questions about displacement of uh, local populations. I mean, you know, obviously these these discoveries don't happen in a vac vacuum. Um, I think that Friedland is also a very canny operator. I think there's also a lot of Chinese involvement in the mine and... Um, that of course uh, pisses off the Americans, um, and but I think it's I think it's pretty legitimate. I'm, I mean, I haven't really I haven't really gone much further than that because I've been focused mainly on mines that have cobalt, and uh, there's very little cobalt at the Kamoko Kula mine. Um, yeah, I mean, it's also it's also a fairly new mine, so we so we don't really. So we haven't really um, seen much of much of what's happening there. You spent quite a lot of time in the country um, mm -hmm. as well, spoken, I presumably extensively with lots of other people who spent lots of time in the country and then even more mm -hmm. who live in the country. So wh what is the state that the Congo has been left in after all of this kleptocracy, after all of the Dan Gertlers of the world and all the colonial history? I mean... There are the Congo pretty much tops the list and all the bad economic indicators in the world. Can you give your mm -hmm. own explanation in your own words, like what the Congo is like as a consequence of all this? Mm. Well, I mean, it's a country in which there are four different wars happening. Um, it's a country in which, you know, if you are stopped by a policeman on the side of the road. You do not stop for them because, um, you know, the likely consequence of you doing that is them putting a gun in your face and, and demanding a bribe. Um, it's also a country in which um, there is a complete breakdown in trust uh, in any form of uh, official... Uh, explanation for anything so it's a lot of conspiracy theories um and a very sort of maybe warped is not the correct word but it is a, it is warped because it's been it's been warped by you know two centuries almost of of being lied to as a as a people um and uh i think that really has us kind of like uh an effect on 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 people. I think I think if you're constantly lied to, you start losing faith and 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 start acting in ways that uh, that don't really make sense to the rest of the world and so on. And um, you know, at the same time, I think it's also a place. Where there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of um there's a very young population um which which could with you know not necessarily like direct intervention by by government governments but at least like kind of like insistence on on the rule of law and 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 uh fighting against corruption and kind of uh initiatives to 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 promote sort of um, 
clean copper, clean cobalt, clean um, diamonds, whatever, um, that might kind of uh, open the door to um, more faith in the rule of law, because at the moment there, there's really very little faith in the rule of law, and the country has really suffered as a result of it. And, you know, this constant wave of violence, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you followed the... Um, the M23 rebellion in the Northeast and this kind of sense of impunity with which external actors think that they can operate inside the Congo or inside DRC um, is, uh, has led to a kind of the sort of free for all for, for a lot of very bad actors. So, yeah, I don't know what international body would, would, would be best suited to doing so. But um, but yeah, somebody, some some sort of whether it's the United Nations or 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 a, or a kind of a, a organization of African states or something like that. I don't know. That's quite a I desolate think. picture. Um, but like I said, maybe ninety million super young population. Mm -hmm. um, in the discussions you have with people and from your own opinion and understanding is there any sort of way out of it um yeah i mean i think i i think there's kind of like it's, it's an insistence on the rule of law um is one of the ways out of it i think also um holding congo to a much higher standards a much higher standard um with regards to elections you know during the last election it was pretty clear that um uh Felix Antoine Tshisekedi uh who's the current president um did something very strange with regards to the vote and um you know the the uh Martin Fayulu who was the opposition was you know very far in the lead and then you know suddenly the internet and 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 uh and and telecommunications go down in the country and then suddenly you know a couple of days later that you know they they they, they turn everything on and they say look well look for you lose loss and she's won and then so, you know, there are all these um sort of reports about um backroom deals done between the previous president and the current president and then just this kind of mass corruption that's going on and mm. you know um, I think it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty clear what's happening at the moment. I mean, if you look at just the, the, the people around the president, um, you know, there've been ministers and special advisors who have been caught on camera sort of offering all kinds of corrupt deals. I mean, if you look at the president's, um, watch collection, it seems to have flourished in the last couple of years. I mean... It's uh, and and it's just really happening right in front of our faces. And anybody who watches anything that happens in the DRC is sort of very frustrated by it because this is a president who came to power in a very very flawed, if not stolen, election, which was then accredited by the U.S. government because they were worried about. Well, nobody really knows why, but one assumes because they were worried about about um, post-election violence. And then, uh, um, and then, somebody who sort of proceeds to um, basically uh, preside over one of the, uh, you know a cycle of uh, another cycle of corruption. Um, I don't think it sends the right message to Congolese. And the thing is that what while you know, obviously Cong Congolese aren't sort of born corrupt and so on. Um, you have to look back at the Mobutu era when corruption was basically endorsed by M Mobutu as a kind of, uh, as a Zairean or Congolese way of being, um, in which he said there's an unwritten article to the constitution, which is, which is you have to se débrouiller, which is like to to take advantage which 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 means basically like to to make do and you know that means and he said to the, to you know to the army he said well you know you shouldn't worry worry about not being paid you have a gun 
go out and you know go out and Jesus. and ask people for money kind of thing and it's just like that mentality gets reinforced by you know when they see the president stealing the election when they see uh the president's family stealing then you know you're a, a motorcycle driver in uh who's come from the president's province um and you decide to you know you decide to rob whatever in 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 a in in this ta in a town sorry this is actually quite a specific incident that i'm re referring to so i'm not going to go too far into this but basically a lot of people have left the president's province and now are getting accused um uh of you know behaving like they own the rest of the congo and so on um uh, or the rest of congo um uh they and i think that like there's a certain nihilism that creeps in and uh that people sort of think well you know if this is the way the system is if the system is rigged i might as well make do as best i can um and and you know there's no reason to follow the rule of law if i'm not going to get prosecuted and i can make enough um and that can be at a very small scale as well so if this horrible exploitation starting with leopold all the way back then went from well i think Ivory it started before to... leopold it's it started you know it started with portuguese slave owners in the north it started with <coughs> and don't forget as well that you know pre-colonial times there was quite a lot of um there was quite a lot of exploitation and and different um people uh you know, kingdoms raiding each other and so on. Um, but obviously it became sort of industrialized uh, during colonial times. But if we think of um, the specific um, resource exploitation from mm -hmm. ivory to rubber to copper to diamonds to now all these rare earth metals, is the cobalt not rare, phenomenon... Not really rare earths, but, but, but ba battery metals. Resource metals resource metals um are they is cobalt just another step in that line or is there something mm -hmm. special about cobalt and its potential or something different with how it's happening no not not really there's it's it's basically the same because cobalt comes with copper and all these mines are not really cobalt mines um they're you know and they're not first and foremost cobalt mines they weren't initially developed as cobalt mines um, they have now become very important as cobalt mines because of the boom in cobalt prices, but they were developed as copper mines. Um, and copper is a is a by uh, sorry uh, cobalt is a byproduct of copper. So um, the 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 two come together. You don't get pure cobalt in the ground. Can you introduce cobalt to us? So cobalt is uh, used in batteries um, in the cathode which is the um, positive electrode uh, and um, it's used uh, as a kind of um, as a, a basically a, the, the different electrodes store lithium ions and lithium ions move between the electrode and then they release a charge which gives us electricity and allows us to store electricity. Um, cobalt is just a very efficient and quite safe um material to use in the construction of uh the positive electrodes of the um of, of lithium ion batteries um it's also used in um what else is it used in it's used in kind of industrial um uh processes and shipbuilding it's used in sort of as a pigment as well and used i think there's a kind of atomic bomb as well that uses cobalt <laughs> Um, but, um, but I think that was more of a thing in the sixties. Um, but I don't know very much about that actually. Um, so yeah, it's, a uh, 70% of it comes from the DRC. Um, and most of the rest of it comes from sort of Russia, Indonesia, and a couple of other places. And it's a kind of, uh, it's um you know key 
key for the construction of batteries today and uh, has very uh, very high energy density allows one to have very high energy density um uh in in batteries and and sort of uh creates uh, you know there there are other battery technologies but um but cobalt uh in conjunction with nickel and manganese or um just in conjunction with uh lithium and uh, uh, as a sort of cobalt oxide um though th that basically allows you to have a much higher energy density than the other battery technology which is uh, lithium iron phosphate um batteries uh, which is used in many short-range cars produced in China. Um, but, you know, uh, if you get into an electric car in the U.S., it's usually a nickel-manganese-cobalt. Um, the computer that you're using, the cell phone that I'm using to record this conversa com conversation, they have um, uh, batteries that have lithium-cobalt oxide. And... Um, so cobalt is kind of key to the uh, portable device and electric car revolutions, um, which we have seen over the past 20, 30 years. How overhyped is cobalt's role in the green economy, if at all? I don't know if it's overhyped. I think it's one of the arguments that you'll hear from people is that well, we can innovate away from cobalt very quickly, but I don't think we can ever innovate to zero cobalt. So if you look to pro look at projected demand, cobalt is uh, is going to be in very short supply um, unless there's some completely other battery technology, a completely other battery technology. I think there was a um, big Chinese battery man manufacturer came out the other day and said that they've come up with a, they've come up with a sodium ion battery. It's very clear, uh, unclear whether that's going to be able to they haven't really released many details about it, but that, but whether it's going to be a small battery or a large battery or so on. Um, so yes, I think cobalt is going to be with us for the next, you know, 20 years at least. Um, and, you know, the DRC is going to be a key place for that. DRC, DRC also has lithium, which is key in battery construction. They also have... Um, uh, coltan, which is a uh, tantalite, it's like a tantalite ore, which uh, which is key for con uh, constructing sort of batteries and high tech electronics. So, I think that uh, not necessarily cobalt itself, but I think and, and of course copper is key to all of these things because you know an electric car uses something like three times the amount of copper. Um, uh, that a normal car uses, so um, that a normal car uses. Um, so the uh, I I believe that you know it's not necessarily overhyped, but I think it's it's it, it, it's uh, it's definitely sort of central to the way that we should be thinking about where these um, you know where these kind of wonderful new machines are coming from and. I think there's also a kind of like cognitive dissonance happening in that, you know, everybody sort of believes that everybody really understands where sort of crude oil comes from. And there's like a insistence on sort of having uh, lower oil consumption, but these, but the, you know, when you get into a Tesla, when you get into a, to a Nissan Leaf, whatever, you don't really have an idea of where these, um, the, these chemicals and metals and so on that go into the battery are coming from. And people, I mean, at least people I speak to think seem to think it comes from this kind of like magical realm of like not being very polluting. Um, but I was in, I was at some nickel cobalt mines in Indonesia the other day, and they're all powered by coal, coal power plants, massive coal power plants that they've built over the last ten years. Um, you know, and cut down huge amounts of forest and are pumping in, you know, pumping the sea full of chemicals and all the fish have died and all the fishermen are out of jobs and, you know, people are people are sort of getting these terrible warts on their skin if they get into the water and so on. So it's I, I feel like we 
displaced a lot of the pollution from from cities or, or, or we're in the process of displacing um, pollution from wealthy cities to these like poorer areas really on the fringes of, of like the known well, I, I don't know what you want to call it but like the the, the world that um, people in the West or in Europe in the US whatever are aware of and we've kind of we've kind of like sort of forgotten about these parts of the world and we've kind of it's almost like there's a tacit agreement that you know those sort of parts of the world many many of which are somewhat unspoiled um can sort of go to hell because because it sort of uh means that we're not going to be living in in smog filled cities i'm not sure whether it necessarily means that um you know if if we continue to mine in very polluting and dirty ways um especially ways that use a great deal of a great many fossil fuels um i'm not sure if it necessarily means that electric cars will be um less polluting and it, uh, i mean i think there are there, there are studies that say that they're less polluting after 30,000 or so miles um but i think it's very very difficult to measure everything that you know measure the pollution that goes into constructing an electric car battery and i just don't think the data are really there um so i think it's something that we really have to sort of sit and think about and policymakers have to think about um, and i don't think anybody has done that in a, in a serious way so far i think that people have sort of congratulated themselves on moving away from you know carbon to something else but Maybe we're just sort of, you know, jumping from the frying pan to the fire. On the topic of uh, how a company might try to measure its environmental impact through its entire supply chain and then on, out on the other end produce a number and say, hey, look, this is our amount of pollution per unit of clothing made or something like that. There's a company here mm -hmm. in Stockholm, which I think is, a, uh, I mean, this is very, very accusatory but like a fraud on uh, mm -hmm. i met um one of the guys who, who who's uh almost runs it um who isn't a very good guy but anyway he um was explaining how it works and through a through mm -hmm. an example uh company that they have which is a giant swedish clothing brand you know you take a guess you probably get it and you know they want to be able to say that this item of clothing cost x amount of carbon um emitted into mm -hmm. the atmosphere and it immediately falls apart because it goes like one layer deep in their supply chain, not not understanding that maybe they source their cotton from, you know, someone who sourced it from someone who then sourced it from like 50 original um, producers who none of them yeah. maybe are, are, are adhering to the best environmental practices or whatever that they supposedly say they are at the top. I mean, it's another form of greenwashing, right? That example I just meant, but as well, the one that you were saying with the with the electric car up to 30,000 miles, you're green neutral. I mean, prove it. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I think it's, it's, it's almost impossible to prove. And yeah, I mean, let's, let's see. But uh, unless somebody comes up with a really good system, I haven't seen a, a good system. And, you know, people go off these sort of ESG metrics and so on. Um, in a more simplistic way when they're you know when they're buying stocks yeah. and so on and, and just like what does that even just, mean and like it requires way too much complexity for people to be uh taking account um and as soon as your supply chain crosses a border and one of your supplies mm -hmm. in the supply chain crosses his own multiple borders you know just two steps away from the final product you're already in a mess that's almost unsolvable what are you going to do when you're h&m and you've got yeah. maybe like a thousand subsidiaries who each have their own thousand subsidiaries. That's why I think these things are not as important as kind of just having really strong regulation along every step of the supply chain. And maybe that's the company's job. And But I think it's more the job of governments and... Uh, yeah, the company and, won't do uh, it if they're not enforced. Bodies. Yeah, exactly. 
So you said 70% of the cobalt is in the Congo. Is there something special mm-hmm. about the Congo that 70% is there or is that just a consequence of where we've looked for it? It is uh it's a it's something special about the Congo because it was part of it was a ancient sea and it dried in a certain way that these salts were formed and then the salts were buried and they were quite they're not particularly deep. Um Australia has also quite a lot of Congo uh, of of cobalt but um but it's very deep um and uh exploiting it is more expensive um however uh i mean there are a lot of people talking about deep sea mining now which is also another complex environmental process <laughs> um and um you know there are various different uh, questions about, you know, disru- destruction of organisms on the seafloor. Some people argue that, you know, these organisms are less valuable than, you know, organisms that might be saved by lowering carbon output on the other end and so on. I, I mean, there's also a debate to be had there. Um, I just don't think that this has been, you know, any of these debates have been had really seriously, um, especially at a policy level, um, anywhere. And, uh, that is, that, that's basically why I'm interested in writing about it because, because, uh, I think that, um, at least giving people the, the opportunity to think about it and the opportunity to, to read about it and, and the information, which is often um, sort of hidden and uh, or, or just difficult to access because they're, again, far-flung places. And, um, you know, the companies that are involved in it are not necessarily the most, you know, disclosing country companies. Um, I think that's why it's interesting and that's why it's hopefully, you know, that, that I mean, that's why something that that's why I'm trying to trying to <laughs> trying to do this. All right, so we've um, you know introduced the Congo. Um, mm-hmm. We've introduced cobalt. Um, now let's look to your New Yorker piece, which is mm-hmm. this fascinating look into sort of artisanal mining versus big giant s- scale mining, and then this phenomenon that I'd never even thought of, like freelance mining, people just digging in their mm-hmm. own backyard. Um, so wherever you would like to take it, please. Um, well, the New York piece, um, and thank you for your kind words about it, is, is basically um, a look at uh, one specific uh, artisanal mine uh, called Casulo and um, looking at um, the kind of mining boom that started in 2014 there um, and how that sort of translated into that you know neighborhood it's like a sort of uh, it's a suburb of uh, of a larger city called Colwesi. basically the neighborhood started sort of falling in on itself and then everybody was sort of kicked off um by the former governor uh who cut a deal deal with a chinese company who basically said we will accept people who work as artisanal mining uh, miners for a cooperative um and who are properly, you know, formed uh, as miners. Oh, it's, they're properly uh, trained as miners. For, forgive me, I start thinking about mining vocabulary in French. Um, they're they're properly uh, trained as miners and and accredited by a by a by a kind of um, Congolese regulatory body, loose, very loose regulatory body. Um, and so then like everybody else was kicked off the ground then the chinese started paying very low prices then there was a sort of riot against the chinese and so on and so forth um and that kind of goes that i go into that in the piece um and then i look at this as a kind of just one story that kind of illuminates um some of the larger trends happening in in drc um, but yeah, no, artisanal mining isn't necessarily, and there's a way in which artisanal mining can be good and, uh, provide people with a alternative form of livelihood, 
But I think we've reached the threshold, firstly, of how many people can do that. Uh, and there's been a huge kind of internal migration within DRC to the mineral mineral rich south. Um, and um, the infrastructure there really can't handle it. And, you know, there's many and not many as a hundreds of thousands of people living in these kind of shanty towns and, um, you know, people arriving every day, basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's an aspect of the California gold rush to this, but the fact is that cobalt sells for very low prices and um, people just kind of get stuck in a, in a, a cycle of misery, um, which kind of which they're trapped in because they can't, you know, it's not as if they're going to strike it big and then, you know, retire and buy a you know, house in South Africa or something like that, which is, which is kind of the myth that, that there, there were these, at one point, these entrepreneurs who did that. It's more likely that people who are relatively successful end up trading cobalt. Um, that does happen. And I spoke to a couple of people who did that. Um, but nobody's really kind of ended up being, um, I guess some people have become cooperative bosses and so on, but that seems to be much more connected to the like local political grind. Um, and, you know, a lot of these artisanal miners work for cooperatives that are, own, uh, are owned by politicians, which is technically illegal, but uh, but basically they're doing the, the, the politicians' dirty work of mining and being paid a pitt pittance for it. Have you seen uh, the Sebastian Salgado photo of gold, of the artisanal gold? Yes, I have. In Brazil. Are there any scenes dramatic like that that you've come across by going through these different cobalt mines in former copper pits throughout the Congo? Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. Um, the most dramatic uh, scene that I saw, there are two that stand out in my mind. Um, one is this mine called Kawama, which is these kind of illegal miners um, gathered into a syndicate uh, or a cooperative, forgive me, um, called Komakat. And that is on technically on Glencord land outside of outside of Kolwezi. Um And it's just, you know, to the right as you enter just before the the, the checkpoint, I think, um, to get into town. Um, and, or like the highway, whatever, highway toll place. Um, and uh, then you have, and so that's like a kind of mountain and you've got the people sort of, like it's just a sea of humanity mining and kind wow. of chipping away and people kind of crawling over, you know, rocks and, and and sort of wedging themselves into these little tunnels and so on. Wow. The other one that I uh, that I saw is actually in um in area of, it's actually a tin mining area, tin and coltan, which was um, we spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, that's a tantalite ore, um, and you see just hundreds, if not thousands, of people spread over these sites, uh, old Belgian sites. Um, where there are houses and they're kind of mining under the houses and the houses are collapsing in front of you as you're sort of watching oh basically. God. And it's really, wow. really very, that's, I mean, the most visual, uh, um, experience. And then, I mean, it's really children mining. Um, mm. the only question, the only, and, and whereas in the kind of copper cobalt area, it's like, it's big business and, um, local politicians will try and stop you seeing that especially try and stop you seeing children in the mines um in this area which is called monono um in uh the tanganyika province um which is just north of uh or a couple of days journey north of uh of where um where the the copper and cobalt is um this is uh you know, it's it's people sort of scraping an existence off tin mining, and it's not a huge business. Well, it's not a massive business, business, and the, it's much less politically sensitive. Um, that said, um, that area should be sort of you know heading into a boom because it's the world's largest uh, lithium deposit, and an Australian company once again. 
um, called AVZ um, has uh, has bought the cassette or has the right to mine there. Um, the only problem is that they have um, they ran into some difficulties because a Chinese company tried to take it off them, and now they got forced into. To, I, I'm not 100 percent sure about what what what's happened recently, but basically, a Chinese company has come in with this Australian company, and the um, a red big question is how they. Yeah, great collaborator. Uh, the then there's a, then there's a, a big question about because lithium, um, you have to ex uh, if you mine it, you have to ex export it in bulk, um, unless you like really have like very high tech refining um, capability on site, which we can't do because there's no electricity supply um, in that town. And besides, I mean, you'd need to ship out chemicals and so on. So anyway, the most efficient way is to to rebuild this road but i went along this road to three da days to get down so it doesn't seem to be a particularly uh easy task for whoever's trying to well, i met the people who are trying to get it out and um you know it's sort of daunting but they were approaching it with uh with um with a sort of uh uh an old-fashioned zeal I would say. <laughs> I'd love to uh, see photos. I'm assuming you took photos, whether professional or just with your phone. Um, it'd be, I mean, fascinating to see. Uh, how did you yeah, feel when you saw this, um, what I'm assuming, if it's anything like the Salgado photo, just extremely primal, um, every man for himself type atmosphere? Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'd seen this at Salgado photos before and I was just kind of like, you know, when you kind of see something that you have seen pre, but also this, those photos are from the eighties. So I was like, I was like, wow, this is still kind of happening as well. That's like, the that's of, crazy. Yeah. The thing that the thing that really shocked me, and I, I and then also you just feel really sad because mm. these people are very desperate and the children are really, I mean, it's kind of heart wrenching. So, I guess it's that. Um, it's that sort of like I don't know. I'm sure there's some kind of like Freudian term for it. Uh, you know, kind of identification of of something that you something that kind of existed only in your imagination and then uh, and then also just an intense sadness as well a quote from the new yorker piece children who work in the mines are often drugged in order to suppress hunger mm -hmm. so i'd love to hear you talk about child labor in all of this as well mm -hmm. your your discoveries and then as well perhaps how pervasive it might be um, what can be done about it is it also the other side of the argument like hey the kids got literally no better option yeah but i don't think i mean i don't think children should be mining full stop i mean it's a very very dangerous I mean, yeah, activity I, I i i agree but i'm just saying for the sake of the no 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 i i, the I question mean, i'm just uh, I, I i look there's a all over africa you're gonna and in many in many sort of um less wealthy countries you'll find children working on a regular basis um but i think mining specifically is a very very dangerous activity um and uh, you're also working with chemicals that are not safe for adults and even more dangerous for children um you know people don't really live very long there um and so and and even the people who are mining as you know are saying well, I'm doing this so my children won't have to. So, I mean, I think everybody understands that it's not, it's not a great situation for children to, to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody knows how many children are involved in, in mining there. And I don't think there's, a pro there's probably not a fixed number um, because it's very informal. And, you know, 
there are probably uh, several thousand, I mean, actually putting an exact number on this or, or even a kind of ballpark number, but I would say there are there are many, many children working in, in the mines um, and there are many children doing work which is dependent to, to mining, including washing of minerals, including sorting of mineral, minerals, including, um, you know, kind of lugging minerals around in sacks. So it's stuff that's kind of not, you know, they're not going down into the mines, but they're doing the, they're doing all this other uh, labor with the minerals, which are, again, um, not particularly um, healthy for them to be carrying and also... You know, obviously, if you're involved in child labor, you're not, um, you know, you're not going to school and you're not, uh, you're not, um, you're not, you're not studying and doing your homework and stuff like that. So kind of uh, perpetuates the cycle of misery and poverty and, um, and uh, ensures that another generation is kind of left out. Can you tell a personal anecdote? from an experience you had with child labor? Um, well, I can tell you about, what can I tell you? Um, I went to several schools and uh, one which was run by a Catholic charity called Bon Pastor. And then another one, which was run by a uh, charity that I had actually um, volunteered with in in Greece um, to do some teaching called Still I Rise, and they have a they have a school called Pomoja, and you know you sit there and 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 both both schools very kindly, you know, uh, were able to introduce me to children and. Uh, and um, I was able to speak to them uh, sort of broadly about their stories. And it's just sort of heart-wrenching. I mean, there are the children who will tell you that they have been, you know, working in the mines longer than they can remember. And some children will say, you know, I started when I was three. And at the time, there was what one kid. What utility who I, could you? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. Well, no, no, but I'll tell you what utility. So. One kid who I actually talk about in the New York piece called Zicky, who was who was doing this supposedly when he was three, and I said, "Listen, that can't be true." And he said, you, "They said, no, 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 you know, um, I didn't believe this either." This was speaking to a Kenyan lady, and she, and and she said, "But then I I went to the mines and I saw the kids, and what they do is they they sort the minerals as very young very young children." And then there was like a point where I was speaking to some official and he was like, oh, yeah, well, the children really understand, like, we're quite proud of our children because they 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 they, they really know the difference between minerals. So it's like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not that useful, but I mean, I'm sure there would be like, you know, there's a much more efficient way of doing it. But... Um, but that's basically what you know. What happens? I think it's it's very 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 depressing. And then there's a lot of prostitution around the mines. There's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of, you know, and not that these miners are terrible people. I mean, there are probably terrible people among them. But um, but I think that mining in general, you know, especially this kind of small scale artisanal mining, brings out. Um, you know, there's a kind of uh, uh, very dark side to, to to what happens, and you know, you get a lot of young men, you get a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, you know, it's 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 very violent, and a lot of bribes being paid, a lot of illegal activity, and uh, obviously that's a very very dangerous environment for children to be in. So. All of this knowledge that you've um, accumulated on cobalt mining in the Congo is in mm -hmm. with the purpose of writing a book. I wonder, you know, what mm -hmm. what is your hope from the book? Um, 
do you want to cause change in people thinking about batteries or how the environmental cost of mining um yeah yeah i think all of the above i think i mean i i i would i i just as i was saying earlier i i don't want people to to continue living in this sort of dream world where they believe that um all of this stuff sort of comes from the heavens um or from you know the wizardry of silicon valley without any negative uh effect elsewhere and so i guess even that kind of you know coming to terms with with this sort of um basic hypocrisy of what we, what we call the green revolution and then hopefully sort of starting or hopefully contributing or adding fire to a conversation that's being had you know in small small circles and maybe expanding those circles slightly um about um actually doing this i mean because you can do all of this in a way that's that's environmental and you can do all this in a way that's that's clean and you can do all this in in a way that that gives back to the people whose land that you're doing this on um but i feel like we've chosen uh a way that um that involves mass displacement and it involves um you know mass pollution and it involves these really nasty things like child labor on one end of the spectrum and it involves corruption on the other end of the spectrum and basically i i hope that the message is is optimistic but it's also saying you know it's saying listen there is a better world that's possible but at the same time saying look wake up this is this is not the right way of doing these things um so but uh one wonders what the utility of uh, writing books is these days. I mean, maybe maybe it would be better to do it on TikTok. <laughs> um, what is the actual tangible change that could happen? Presumably, you could enforce really, really, really strict third-party bodies that are going to ensure the supply chain meets all these requirements that you set out for in your book. But what can be done when fundamentally the country it comes from, whether that's the Congo, you know, Chad, Indonesia, wherever, mm -hmm. they are not locally enforcing those rules. Therefore, the incentive is greater to employ the child, to um, expose people to the horrific chemicals um, and all of the really horrific downside that, that we've spoken about. Like... From I think, the West, I think you can that, make the yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's part of the problem, and I think that the part of the problem is that China doesn't have such a strong insistence upon these kind of. I mean, to put it very lightly, to, to doesn't have such a strong um, will to get this done. Mm. Um, don't give a fuck. I think Could if that you... be a lightly way to say it? No, not necessarily. I think the Chinese, I mean, I think there are some Chinese companies that have better environmental standards than others. And I think there are lots of Chinese companies that don't buy from children, for example. There are very notable ones that do. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think basically kind of trying to you know have the the buyers um maybe one has to compel them to do so because uh, through legislation to really um to insist on a better standard and a better quality of uh of um of you know uh you know, labor or, or, or it, it insist on better labor rules, better environmental rules, and so on. Um, and I think that you know, if it were, I mean, maybe, you know, again, it's 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 about getting that conversation going. I, I, I mean, I think that 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 will be incredibly complicated, and there's a lot of work to do so. Um, but I think that you know, if you start insisting on the rule of law in 
DRC, if you start insisting on, you know, or Chad or, or wherever we're talking about, um, you know, that's the first kind of step and, st you know, start sort of penalizing um, institutions and so on that don't follow it rather than, I mean, this is my point about the president, rather than sort of paying lip service to somebody who who is who is uh, continuing to act in a very corrupt way um, and sort of turning a blind eye to corruption. I think that's like, that's the first step is, is, is saying, listen, like we need free and fair elections. And by the way, stop stealing, um, stop stealing your country's resources, stop plundering. Nick, any more, um, anything left that we've left on the table in terms of your work in the Congo, the Congo itself and cobalt mining? No, that I mean, there's well, there's probably a huge amount left, um, but uh, I think we hit hit a lot of bases, and I think we had a good conversation. Nice. Well, it's not over yet. If uh, you would allow me a bit more time, I'd Absolutely. like to completely switch gears and just ask you <laughs> a little bit more, um, you know, personal interest questions that I mm -hmm. felt, yeah, wrote down, sure. knowing I was talking to you. Um, what, what what sort of status does one get in the journalistic world, literary world, by being a New Yorker writer? Um, well, I am not a New Yorker staff writer, so I would not be able to tell you what kind of status one one gets from that. <laughs> but uh, I think um, obviously it's a great byline to have. I think the great thing about the New Yorker is the editing process, um, and it's an amazing place to work. It's, uh, um, you know, I, I worked uh, as a fact checker at the New Yorker for quite a long time, almost five years. And the, the dedication and sort of, um, insistence on the process that, uh, uh, people bring to the, you know, bring to their work every day. I mean, that's, that you don't really, don't really see that many other places. I mean, it's also sort of, you know, pretty well resourced um, and uh, it allows you to write at length, which is which is a great plus. I mean, I, I also write for The Nation, which is a great place to work as well. Um, and uh, the only thing that I would say is, is you know, you, you can write at much greater length at The New Yorker. Um, and uh and that is that is obviously a plus um come a bit closer to the mic oh yeah uh, so obviously you can you can write a, a, a you know the new yorker allows you to write a sort of 9 10 11 12 if you're lucky a thousand words and that is a great plus because you mm -hmm. know you can really develop some d develop an idea and when you're talking about you know something like cobalt mining which is marries science geology politics history you know etc it's very difficult to do that in sort of a compressed um you know 2000 word piece what would it take for me to get a job at the new yorker someone who has zero pedigree in journalism well i think you could apply to the fact checking department um uh or the um the copy desk i guess um i think there are sort of editorial roles at the um on the online desk but usually i think they're looking for a little bit of journalistic experience um a lot of people um do internships at other magazines and then because the new yorker doesn't do internships um and then sort of jump over to the uh, i was being a bit flippant work more saying oh. what does it take you know what type of person do you need to be what type of thing do you need to write about um i don't know i mean i think you know I, there's this idea that this is like like a collection of nerds or like like almost academics or whatever but i think everybody's quite sort of relaxed and just people who are sort of enthusiastic and like also can, can kind of see the um the kind of um 
who 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 sort of don't take themselves too seriously i i suppose um that's been my experience so everybody's like very um you know they they're quite like uh obviously there are exceptions but but um you know the 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 people are very well well versed in their subjects but they also mm. you know don't don't sort of run around showing off i think it's, it's <laughs> nice um, nice but it's and a good you, place to work because of that did you always know that you wanted to do journalism um i uh wanted to do journalism since i did a kind of like uh sort of underground newspaper at my high school and almost got kicked out because we accused these teachers of all kinds of things and then it turned out that like <laughs> justifiable we were we were onto some story about like chinese oh, nice. students being allowed in and then it like ended up blowing up into like a major scandal at some point because a chinese communist party's official a, a chinese <laughs> communist party officials wife ended up killing the person that was getting these kids into our school in england i mean it was it was wow. really it was really crazy and we had that story and then it was kind of suppressed by the school anyway so <laughs> two years before the ft had it or whatever it was and so i was like nice, oh god nice. i wish but you know that was my great scoop that i missed and so you fell in love with it or maybe not fell in love with it maybe i'm just uh connecting the dots way too aggressively but at least you did it in high school uh did you then go and do mm -hmm. like a traditional education in journalism no i yeah no i went to um school in the states um i was at yale i went to the yale daily news which is a kind of daily newspaper it's like a very old storied daily newspaper and i uh helped reinvent and sort of recreate the um the arts and living section there with some friends and we did some kind of we kind of moved the we shifted the insistence to sort of uh long form journalism and sometimes you wouldn't call what we wrote journalism either uh and i did my degree in english and french and sort of world literature I guess, and critical theory and things like that. Um, and then uh, I did a series of internships and I thought, you know what, I actually really enjoy journalism and I love writing like this. And I like academic writing, but at a certain point there was like a, you know, there's a choice that one has to make. And I quite like the kind of exper experiential aspect of journalism, um, you know, going out to different places and meeting lots of people and so on so that was that was kind of that was sort of what made me that sort of pushed me towards um various different publications after college and then i went to journalism school uh, after a year of working at the independent in the uk and are you officially like a freelance journalist who has yeah okay can you explain um the economics of freelance journalism not good <laughs> yeah no actually it's a bad question i more mean because you've got the new yorker and the atlantic you said you write for so presumably the nation. there is some the sorry the nation um so presumably there is you know there's at least some reliable income there in addition to yeah and also i have a, i have a I have a book deal, um, and I'd also be lying if I, uh, I, I have some family, uh, some money for my family as well. So I'm able to kind of like put things, you know, have things kind of ticking over. Um, it is unfortunately not a great thing to do if you want a re reliable stream of in in income. Mm -hmm. um, the trick is i would say just kind of diversifying and doing kind of lots of little jobs here and there um and so i've ended up doing all kinds of things i've like taken photo photographs for brands i've um i got involved in like a, a shoe brand taking pictures and like you know <laughs> trying to do stuff that I, I wrote travel articles as well for um tatler magazine in the uk um i have 
judged literary awards i've done like i've done all kinds of weird little things and that will kind of um manages to manages to sort of put things together um and uh i think basically that's kind of you know i i i think being a pure freelance journalist is very 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 difficult um and only yeah only doing freelance journalism um i have sort of diversified I, income I'm, streams and yeah i'm uh, yeah. I, i'm i'm struggling to just ask the question that i want to ask which is mm -hmm. direct advice from you i've got a story um about two from sweden you know one about a mm -hmm. ridiculous surge in uh, cocaine importing and cocaine demand and all the drug violence that comes with that and then as well one about the sort of disconnect between the Stockholm um, virtue signaling about a Sami mine all the way up the top of the country uh, they mm -hmm. don't want um, an iron ore an iron mine to go there mm -hmm. so two stories obviously they've got extremely narrow interest you know people aren't going to be google mm -hmm. searching it but nonetheless i i think um irrespective of how well they're written or anything like that but just the stories have uh some place somewhere i am someone with zero journalistic pedigree i have had one freelance article published in american magazine but it's not like it went to any readership at all so mm -hmm. your advice to me how do i shop this around how do i maximize the um, time put in it'd be nice to break even i've got no ambition of of profiting mm -hmm. but to just not have it you know waste away in a blog um i think go sort of work out which um publications you really like and think about where it would um work well have they published um, not the same story, obviously, because you don't want you don't want to be reporting what they've already done. But have they published similar pieces? And um, you know, is it the right tone? Is it you know, do you do you do you see it more as a kind of you know indictment of um, the people who are going to be exploiting this mine, or do you see it as more of a kind of like conversational? Um, uh kind of chatty piece like is it is it more of a, a magazine story or is it a newspaper story um what length do you want to write it at just just think about that and then and then just like look around your favorite publications and then just start pitching i mean it's it's always good to pitch to places that you read because you can talk about those places if you're pitching to kind of magazines that you've never read before then you're going to have to do a lot of reading to kind of work out who their sort of most famous writers are and the, the you know what their editorial style is like. If it's a, if it's you know if you're if you're talking about somewhere that you know, you can kind of hit the ground running. Um, and then I don't know. I I was just I'm just thinking about those two ideas. I mean. Uh, the Swedish mine, I mean, that's quite difficult because these sort of environmental stories, unfortunately, are very, very difficult to pitch to various places. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of the nation and they do have uh, they do have uh, they do have coverage of various places. I'm not sure if they necessarily um, would take it completely unsolicited and then i'm where else maybe somewhere like mother jones but i don't really uh, um yeah i would say probably somewhere like that um in english uh, sorry in american press and then maybe the guardian in the uk press yeah, the be, guardian be a good place to and then sort of try and figure out um who the editors are there and somebody actually gave me a very good piece of advice which was um which was, uh, or somebody when I was at journalism school said, listen, you are developing these skills in investigative journalists. So do your sort of investigation of whatever publication you want to pitch to and figure out who the editors are and what they, you know, what they want to be pitched. Um, so figure out the writers on publications that you like and um, figure out, you know, 
uh, who their editors are and then sort of speak to those writers and see whether they'll put you in touch with editors and so on. Um, and you, yeah. And then the cocaine story, I mean, I'm sorry if other people have told you this, but it does sound like a sort of made for vice story. Um, because they've always been very good at covering that kind of thing, but maybe not, yeah. I don't know. And I don't know anything about Swedish publications, but maybe there's a Swedish publication that also publishes in English. Yeah, there's one, there's one, but it's more for like affiliate links and stuff, you know, so the top 10 cafes, the top 10 restaurants, you know, how to get a visa, this type of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Uh, I, I, I really sincerely really appreciate the advice. Um, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I've got two gossipy questions for you and then three that I try to ask every single guest. Okay. The first, what is yeah. Alec Baldwin like? Alec Baldwin um, was very nice and um, was... I'm sorry, that's an awful answer. Um, <laughs> Alec Baldwin nice. was... Tell no, how you it's really amazing feel. he... <laughs> No, I, I mean, I was amazed at Alec Baldwin, you know, he actually, his production team contacted me and then, and then I said, listen, call me back, um, on, on my telephone, because as, as you've seen, I'm terrible on emails. And, uh, <laughs> and so then in the middle of the night, I got a call from him and he was very <laughs> sort of gracious and said, listen, um. Uh, am I disturbing you? Are you, are you working? So unfortunately, I'm actually in bed. But um, but yeah. Um, and then um, no, I just met him for that conversation, and you can hear that conversation. He's he's very um, he was very respectful and and um, very supportive of journalists journalism. So um, and journalists. Uh, so that was that was that was always very positive. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I thought it was a a really good um, uh, podcast as well. Like he was a good host. He's got a terrific voice. Yeah. Um, such a great voice, isn't he? Yeah, uh, John Lee Anderson. This is a person I've yes. been trying to track down for several years because um, mm -hmm. of his Che biography. He's an absolute perfect mm -hmm. person to be a guest on this podcast. Are you mates with him? He's a writer. Um, from I don't. I don't know him very well. Um... Um, uh, but he is, I have fact checked a piece that he wrote and, um, and he was a wonderful, yeah, he was like a kind of, um, wonderful person to work with. And he's really, he's really like a cool, cool guy. So definitely Bill Finnegan too. The New York has such cool writers. <laughs> yeah. Really cool. Bill Finnegan is, yeah. uh, I read the surfing book um, last year and I loved it. It was amazing. Mm. Um, and I'm not a surfer in any way, shape or form. So um, <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah. All right, mate. Three questions I try to ask every guest. The first, could you please talk about the role that serendipity has played in your life? Um, oof, I mean, just endless amounts of serendipity, but... Um, you know, uh, I think it's probably the most important force, and especially in journalism as well. I mean, you, you know, you especially. I mean, on this last reporting trip I made to Indonesia, you know, we stopped in this town, and the fixer was saying, you know, the translator was very, very con concerned about, you know, who we spoke to, whether they were going to be reported to the local police. We sat down and these people agreed to, you know, make coffee for us. And then it turned out that they had actually been displaced by one of the mining companies. And it was, I mean, the whole thing was kind of just sort of uh, fell into um, fell into shape thanks to these just sort of stream of serendipitous interviews. Um, I think oftentimes when you're uh, when you're reporting in places where um, People are less used to, um, you know, scheduling things months and months in advance. Obviously, um, one has to rely a little bit on serendipity. Beautiful. And I'm really sorry. I just realized I'm looking at my notes. We we totally skipped over you being arrested in the Congo. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, do you want to 
Do you want to speak about that for a minute or or is it too sure, disconnected to from where we are? Sure. Um, I was arrested in Congo for reporting on one of these sort of separatist groups. Um, and... Um, well, I mean, I was just... I was basically following a lead that somebody told me, that somebody had given me about them being involved in mining. It seems like it pissed off the government that I was speaking to them. There's also a suggestion that, that they thought that we were close to another story about the president's family being involved in mining. Um, but uh, it really wasn't what we were reporting on, so I'm not sure if that's them sort of just getting the wrong end of the stick. Anyway, we were me and uh, my translator were, were taken and we were arrested. We were shipped across the country and... We were sort of held in incognito, sorry, in communicado, in, in detention. Um, while we were being transferred, I um, slipped somebody a note and um, I, so we were transferred on a civilian flight. So uh, I was able to uh, pass a note to the pilot and to, uh, and to a passenger saying, listen, I'm an American citizen, here's my passport number, and uh, yeah, that's basically what happened. And, you know, they, the consulate got involved, and I was released after almost six days, and or five and a half days, and the my translator was released uh, two weeks later, which was pretty, pretty um, nerve-wracking, you know, it was kind of... Mm. I was very worried for him. Um, you know, not we didn't really get fed very much, but we were treated, I mean, as well as one could be treated in that kind of situation. Um, you know, the obviously it was pretty, pretty grim in many ways, but, um, you know, not beaten or anything like that. So that was mm. good. And... Do you think that had you not been able to slip a note, you may have fallen much, much deeper into that whole corrupt system? Yes. And um, and I think we would have been stuck there for many more weeks. Mm. But I also had lots of people asking where I was. And actually, John Lee Anderson was a, was a, was a key link. Um, he, I think he... Uh, he uh, met with somebody in a bar in Nairobi who said, listen, there's a New Yorker writer who's been, who's been locked up in Congo. And then he got in touch with the um, editor in chief who, who was sort of uh, David Remnick, who was, who was incredibly, incredibly uh, along with a whole bunch of other people. But um, he was one of the kind of main, main reasons that I, that I was uh, released so quickly. And, um, very very appreciative to everybody who sort of worked tirelessly to mm. to secure my release and does it make you think twice about uh, future trips to the congo uh, i'm not allowed i'm not allowed back in so for the moment ever again in your life or at I'd least sign a piece of paper saying it saying that i that, that oh, i am not shit i'm sorry is that is that um like a terrible loss for you Yes, it's really sad. But, um, and there are many things that I'd love to be covering there at the moment, but, uh, c'est la vie. Fuck. Yeah. C'est la vie. Okay. Um, thank you for also answering that. I'm sorry. Morocco, into Morocco for very similar reasons. To say that again? I'm also not allowed into Morocco for very similar reasons. So, okay. So you've got two African countries off the list. African countries off the list. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for not, yeah, including that in the cobalt part of the conversation. No, no, it's fine. But I'm, I'm thank you for, um, yeah, for for answering as well. And Absolutely. if you're ready, I say we conclude with the two okay. questions that I try to give every guest. The first being, mm -hmm. what is a country that you are particularly bullish on? Um, well, I mean, I think China probably has a pretty bright future i'm not sure if i'd invest in it um 
even with the demographic the- collapse looming? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think well, maybe that will maybe that will make it um, even more appealing. Um, How's that? So? Uh, concentrate, concentrate, uh, concentrate wealth in the country. Anyway, um, but uh, I think I don't know. Um, I mean, opt- uh, you know, optimistic. I mean, there's this there's. there's Quite a lot to be pessimistic about in the world these days. So, um, God, it's such a shame how how kind of more trending that answer is over the last few months. More and more guests are saying, yeah. "I can't even think of one example." Um, yeah, which I mean, it's a terrible signal. Yeah, I mean, I think Indonesia has a lot going for it, but then, like, you look at this this like recent sort of ban on you know sexual relations outside of marriage, and. Uh, and uh you worry about the kind of the 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 the, the backsliding into into um sort of theocrat a theo- a theocracy and so on so i think that's i think that's very concerning final question um if you could witness a conversation between any two people of history dead or alive no language barrier so it would be a podcast who are you listening to mm-hmm. God, probably um, I don't. I have no idea. Well, I mean, I think I mean it, 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 if if one could just click one's fingers, I mean, there are just there. I mean, be fascinated, you know, to 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 hear sort of great people of the you know the 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 the, the very evil and very famous people of the 20th, of 20th century history speak to one another or like, you know, Einstein or whatever, but it probably would be fascinating. I mean, to me, it would be even more fascinating to see people who had never, um, were never sort of recorded um, in, in actual life. So somebody, I, I probably like, uh, maybe like Plate, uh, maybe uh, some, uh, Socrates and uh, and uh, and then somebody somebody from the Eastern tradition, but who I don't know. I'm trying to think. Let's say Einstein and Socrates. Nice one. Moment. I like it. That'd be quite the chat. But there are so many good ones. I mean, I've been I've been listening to lots of Joan Didion um, lectures recently, and I've I'm just I love listening to her voice, and she's I think she's just genius. Anyway, what what does she talk about? She, just talking about writing and talking about you know the way that America had, had you know developed over the last fifty years and so on. Mm. I just think she's She's a, a real. She's incredible. Anyway, where, where do you? Where is your cultural roots? Where do you feel like you belong to? Um, I am Greek, but have been kind of. I'm a member of the Greek diaspora, I suppose. Okay, <laughs> nice. A diasporic well, nation. Nick, Efaristo, um, for all your time. And, and uh, for being so generous with your answers. Um, and I really hope that when the book comes out, uh, we get another chance to speak and promote Absolutely. it. Yeah, well, I'll send you a copy if you'd like. Absolutely. All right. Cheers. Stay well and uh, cheers and don't get too cold in, in Sweden.